and welcome to our symposium on comparative genocide studies and the Holocaust. I'm Joachim Safelsberg. I'm on the sociology faculty in the Arsham and Charlotte Ornessian chair at the university. Uh, and I will start with the most pedestrian of announcements, speaking to the most basic human needs there are, which is a necessity. Uh, the restrooms, if you leave this room to the left and then you turn to the right, that's where they are restrooms. For the speakers of this symposium, uh, that's the other side of the coin, there will be free meals. Um, they will be provided uh, to everyone who has a, has a name tag up there. Uh, the, um, make sure you have a name tag. The um, uh, other announcement I should make is for the speakers to, to absolutely use this microphone because the presentations will be recorded. Um, one announcement for the organization of our discussions. Uh, we will have presentations, we have chairs and who will comment on the discussions and pose discussion questions. And then the floor will be open to the symposium participants but also to the audience. Uh, we will distribute cards for the audience to write questions on. This is a more effective way to, and efficient way to to manage the uh, proceedings. Um, uh, I think Alejandro wanted to thank the uh, Institute for Global Studies and its wonderful director, Evelyn David Heiser, who will uh, say a few words of greeting in, in just a moment. Did I leave out anything, Jennifer, that I should have said? All right. Um, there's Bob. Alejandro, please, Very good. you say the okay. elevated things. No, just uh, a word of welcome to everybody. Good morning, my name is Alejandro Bear. I'm the director of the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, and I'm also faculty in the sociology department here. And uh, we're very pleased to have a distinguished group of, of scholars, of museum directors, of educators who will, um, and we, we look forward to two days of, of an engaging, productive, and unfruitful dialogue about the topic that we have laid out, Holocaust and genocide studies, Holocaust studies, genocide studies, conflict and conver convergence. Uh, in the program, you will see the questions that we have um, uh, put ourselves as guiding uh, questions for, for these two days. Uh, some of those questions are, um, well, what is the place of the Holocaust in contemporary genocide research, education, memorialization? To what extent is our understanding of, of genocide and mass atrocities filtered through the lens of the Holocaust, conditioned by existing definitions in international law? How are differences and similarities accounted for? When are analogies and terminology pertaining to the history of the Holocaust and the concept of genocide applied? to other cases, past and present, and what are the benefits and what are the limitations of such framings. So, um, and we're glad to have also Barb Fry here, uh, who's the director of the Human Rights Program, and uh, a colleague and a friend, uh, and uh, since, uh, has been several years now, well, I think, uh, for some time that we've been collaborating on different projects and I think one, one of the most uh, not only fruitful but uh, satisfying things of, of working here at the College of Liberal Arts in the University of Minnesota is having the opportunity to engage in these uh, collaborations which make uh, our work so much uh, more enjoyable and as I said also more, more fruitful and insight, we, having insight from different perspectives, different fields. Uh, different disciplines. So I'm really glad that uh, we're doing this and this is also part of a larger collaboration. Finally, I would like to, to, um, to introduce uh, Evelyn David Heiser, who's a director of uh, the Institute of Global Studies, who provides a platform for several centers and programs, such as the Center for Holocaust Genocide Studies, the Human Rights Program, and several other centers. And uh, IGS provides also the support. Uh, the administrative support and the wonderful staff, and I want to, uh, to commend uh, uh, the, the event staff and uh, Jennifer Hammer, who's the coordinator, the program coordinator of the center, who you have been uh, in touch with uh, for um, all, the, um, all the details for coming here to Minnesota. I want to thank you 
for for this always effectful, effective, and um, uh, and great work that you do. And Evelyn, thank you for coordinating this wonderful team. Uh, and without further ado, thanks, Alejandro. Go team. Um, <laughs> I'll just add my words of welcome to uh, the conference, Comparative Genocide Studies in the Holocaust, Conflict and Convergence. It's wonderful to welcome old friends um, and to greet people who perhaps haven't visited our campus in the past. Um, I'd like to congratulate Alejandro and Joachim for putting together this really wonderful uh, symposium and one that addresses such a critical issue in Hol Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Um, I think in the simplest terms, we're curious about how we name such events and how do we compare such events. And last night, we got the symposium off to a good start. Thank you, Joachim, for bringing Professor Timothy Snyder to give the Oanesian lecture and, and um, serve as the keynote for the symposium. Uh, the question of naming and comparison came up last night in the, the Q&A uh, when the question of when do you use the term genocide versus the term mass killing was raised. Um, we kind of skirted this issue once upon a time when we were writing a proposal to the uh, Arsham and Charlotte Onesian Endowment Fund for Justice and Peace Studies at the Minneapolis Foundation, um, and we used the term mass atrocities. Um, that funding proposal was successful and is responsible for uh, the symposium that um, we are able to bring you today. Um, and we are very grateful that that endowment has provided support. Alejandro, I think you've wanted to put on the symposium since you arrived at the University of Minnesota. I remember you talking about it for, for many years. Um, and I wanted to take an opportunity to say a little bit about the increasingly central role that the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies in the College of Liberal Arts is, is playing on our campus. Um, you've heard a lot, I think, last night from Ana Paula Ferreira as well as from Alejandro this morning about the importance of collaboration here. And uh, CHGS has really been um, critical uh, in, in this broader community of human rights scholarship at the university, but also in the broader community of international research centers um, at the university. Uh, Alejandro, you came in 2011? 20, 2012. Um, and since then, he has really built the research profile of the center. Um, he maintained the very strong outreach portfolio that the first director, Stephen Feinstein, had established. Um, but he's increased connections to faculty, to graduate students, to undergrads, uh, and really um, built a number of very strong collaborative projects with uh, other research centers. He alluded to things that he and Barb uh, have done together, the, the human rights program. But he's also worked with the Center for German and European Studies, uh, leading a, a TAZI, a Transatlantic Summer Institute, on mass violence last summer. Um, Alejandro has already thanked uh, the people who have been doing the work in the trenches, Jennifer, Emily, Katie. Um, but I would like to extend my sincere thanks to Alejandro for, for putting this together. And, and Joachim, uh, they, 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 they work together very closely on constructing this. Um, but I think it's, they deserve our, our great thanks. Uh, so let me announce the chair of the next panel, uh, who is Barb Fry. And Barb, uh, we heard about Barb already, director of the Human Rights Program and a very crucial component of all related efforts on campus. And Barb, do you want to introduce the speakers of the first panel, please? I will. I was not prepared to do that, but I'm uh, I'm, I'm delighted uh, to have the opportunity, having um, known Philip for a, a while and having a read uh, Andrew's paper. I'm I'm really looking forward to having uh, their contributions with us today. Let me join my 
um, my voice in welcoming you all here today. We, we do indeed have a really um, wonderful collaborative relationship between our centers and programs at what we've come to refer to as the Human Rights University, um, the University of Minnesota, which uh, in, a, in a decentralized way, um, uh, we, we have various hubs and spokes of human rights scholarship and teaching um, that come together in a very productive way. And this is um, one of the outcomes of that, and it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here with the group. So um, I, assuming we're going in the organization of the program, I will first introduce Andrew Wolford, who is uh, from the Department of Sociology at the Un University of Manitoba. And uh, Professor Wolford also serves as the president of the International Associ Association of Genocide Scholars. His area of research is uh, with regard to indigenous boarding schools in Canada, and he's authored many uh, books uh, and co-authored books uh, on that topic, uh, which is, is, I might add, not only a, a scholarly investigation, but one of intense public policy discussion in Canada, which puts him in, in that special position of genocide scholars who are uh, trying to negotiate current terrain. So um, uh, he's currently working on two community-based research projects with residential school survivors uh, to help commemorate their experiences and enhance societal empathy. Um, most importantly, Andrew, you know, we're neighbors. You know, Winnipeg and, and the Twin Cities are uh, yeah, and sort of in uh, that sort of flyover land where everything we do is done with great heart and always um, uh, undervalued. And so we are really pleased to value you as our opening speaker here today. Thank you. So I will try to make sure I stick to less than the 40 minutes allotted. Oh, I can? Okay. Great. Is that okay? Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Perfect. There it goes. Um, I want to thank the organizers, uh, Alejandro, Joachim, uh, Jennifer, and Katie, and all the people who have made this such a pleasant and easy journey for me, um, as well as the funders and everyone who's contributed. Um, I may not thank them for putting me in the position as the opening speaker or giving me 40 minutes. Uh, I am more used to beginning from a very local perspective and then branching out from there to the universal, to the, the broader connections to the comparative. So you'll probably get a sense of that from my talk. In the spirit of that, I'd also like to open by acknowledging that we're in the territory of Dakota and Ojibwe Anishinaabe peoples. Uh, I do this not just because it's something we do in Canada now, especially post-Truth and Reconciliation Commission, as you know, one means of recognizing our past. But also, I think um, it's important for a couple of reasons. One, uh, North American genocide scholars have, tif have typically ignored North American cases, uh, the experiences of multiple indigenous nations within this, on this continent. So it's important to bring that to the center, particularly in a place such as this. I also do it because it reminds us about the connection between indigenous peoples and territory. Um, Professor Snyder last night gave us some inroads of thinking about the connections of ecology and, and genocide, or mass killing, as he phrased it. And I think this is particularly important in an indigenous context where um, territory is not simply something that sustains the group or provides a means of survival. T territory is often integral to the sense of group identity they possess. So assaults upon territory, whether it's through forced removals or um, you know, processes of elimination that remove indigenous peoples from their territories, have an effect upon the life of the group. And that's something else that I hope will come out of my talk today. <laughs> But I'm going to begin in a different point with a very brief one-line email I received from a fellow genocide scholar. 
Actually, it's someone who I, I greatly respect and continue to respect, not just for their genocide studies work, but for their work in broader areas of, of research. I'll say no more without <laughs> revealing this person because I do respect them. But the one line email I got, and I was very excited to see his name pop up in my, in my email. I'm like, oh wow, I'm getting an email from blank. Uh, but the email said, Canadian boarding schools are not genocide. He and I had recently both been in a, an edited volume so he must have seen my paper there and decided that he would give me his determinative opinion. Canadian boarding schools are not genocide. There was no subject heading for the message. He didn't bother to sign his name after writing that. Love from so-and-so. Um, so I wondered about his position of authority there. How was he able to make that statement, that judgment, without allowing any debate, dialogue, wasn't an invitation to discussion, it was a decision. So in the paper I say, he was being a prick. <laughs> I mean this not as a belated comeback, though I kind of do, uh, but rather to speak to what feminist legal scholars such as Carol Smart have identified as the phallic nature of masculine judgment in Western law. The judge stands alone, raised above the court, and issues a decision through monological reflection after all sides present their case. It's an instance of what Donna Haraway refers to as the God trick of seeing everything without being situated anywhere. The judge is, in this sense, phallic, a prick. The symbolism is not merely coincidental. Instead, it reflects the masculine nature of formal legal reasoning. We could also talk about the masculinity of genocide studies and the ways in which um, the field has been dominated by people like myself. White males have often been in preeminent positions within this, so I think this phallic metaphor goes beyond simply the legal realm here. I also want to be careful when I talk about law because I don't want to treat law in a monolithic sense. Um, law is not necessarily phallic in each and every instance. For those of you who have spent any time in courts, um, hopefully as observers, um, you know, you see that sometimes negotiation or informal practices actually work into that formal legal atmosphere, such as plea bargains that take place on the courtroom stairs. So there are p opportunities or moments when it's more dialogical than monological in that sense. So I don't want to give the wrong impression here, but certainly there is a tendency within law to privilege this idea, the God trick, of being able to reflect upon competing cases and arrive at a learned, dispassionate decision. <clears throat> so it provides us in a context where, on occasion, it's possible to be a prick, but so does academia. The prickish nature of the latter was further brought home in 2015 by an incident at Sacramento State University when a professor of US history argued in class that the term genocide is not an accurate descriptor for settler and government actions against indigenous peoples in the US. This was prior to Ben Madley's convincing book, An American Genocide, which provides overwhelming evidence to support the case for the applicability of the UNGC to California, as well as other scholars who have made similar cases who I won't uh, list off here. Uh, but Chinabana Johnson, a student of Diné and Meidu heritage, challenged her professor and was asked to leave the class. What followed was a much publicized debate that led too often to either the demonization of the professor as a genocide denier or dismissal of the student as a disruptive presence within the classroom. I raised this case not to engage in the debate about genocide it engendered. My views on the topic, you can probably guess from my research portfolio that was, uh, my bio that was read, I do have a position upon this that comes through my work with indigenous peoples and indigenous communities. Um, but despite this position, I recognize that genocide is an essentially contested topic, and therefore accept the professor's freedom to make his argument with whatever nuance he might have applied in that case, even if I do disagree with him. This is not to say, though, that he isn't being a prick in the sense that I've described above. He made a formal decision about a case, and he would brook no debate within the classroom. That formal judgment is on occasion a reflex in genocide studies should not come as a surprise to any of us. Our subject matter is formed from the bedrock of juridical reasoning. The concept's origins rest in Raphael Lemkin's effort to create a new law, and the United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide eventually was codified into an international statute 
So this conceptual architecture, unfortunately, inspires mimetic responses among professors who become too eager to draw upon the grammar of accusation and adjudication registered therein. So in other words, they replicate the roles of other institutional pricks, in particular the judge, bestowing learned decisions based upon the god trick and closing down discussion. So in this way, I you know, understand uh, Professor Snyder's hesitancy to talk about genocide last night because you know, it does lead to this sort of conflict this sort of misunderstanding. But I open with these anecdotes because I wish to begin my um, reflections today with a discussion of reductive juridical tendencies within comparative genocide studies, or what we might refer to uh, legal formalism, as legal formalism, and how these tendencies influence patterns of conflict and convergence, one of our main theme for the conference. While some scholars may see in formal law an opportunity, to, an opportunity for an opera, uh, a well-respected, accepted, operational definition that could be applied to multiple cases. My own view tends to be more along the lines of a deconstructionist approach where we understand the force of law or any rendering of the law to rest upon a moment of decision. An arbitrary decision is ultimately at the basis of the creation of any law. So the deconstructive goal then is to unpack that law to show that arbitrary decision even though we recognize that such decisions have to be made because we do face a world where there is suffering, where there is injustice. So we have to continue to make law to develop concepts with the idea that these are open to continuing critique. Um, now this isn't the only way that genocide scholars approach this issue. Some choose instead to completely forego any uh, legal or ju formal juridical reasoning in their papers to say, uh, for example, as Donald, Donald Bloxham does, that the goal of the genocide scholar should simply be to elaborate the case in as fine a detail as possible and then leave it to the reader to assess whether or not genocide has occurred. For me, though, this simply postpones the juridical moment, leaving it to the reader to make the judge to be the judge after considering all sides of the issue. As far as the Holocaust is concerned, it does sometimes contribute to the prevalence of formal legal reasoning within our discipline. This is not necessarily anything that is particular to the Holocaust that causes that, but more the way in which it is understood. This world historic event is embedded, for example, in the very conceptual architecture of genocide studies, which presents a challenge for critical genocide scholars working to think beyond its boundaries. For example, the debates at the United Nations General Assembly over the proposed inclusion of cultural genocide in the Genocide Convention are indicative of this influence. My country, Canada, threatened to drop out from the United Nations Genocide Convention if cultural genocide, which was described by the Canadian delegate as a <coughs> dilution of the purpose of the convention, was included. Um, <clears throat> this is quite interesting, actually, because you can see in Raphael Lemkin's memoir, he went on a, a late night walk um, one July, and he met up with the Canadian ambassador, Dana Wilgris, and they talked, and he was under the impression that Canadians were great supporters of the convention. But within a couple days of that discussion, a telegram came from Ottawa uh, from, through the Department of Justice saying that by no means should Canada sign on to the United Nations Genocide Convention unless Article 3 on cultural genocide was excised from the convention. The rest of the convention was fine, but Canada could not support that part. And that they should look to their friends in the US for support on this because they had the feeling that the US felt the same way. So, <clears throat> an implicit comparison with this idea of dilution. Canadians never presented starkly some of the reasons, other reasons, the, the um, self-interested reasons why they did not want cultural genocide included. Um, they always spoke at the General Assembly of the problem of dilution. But the idea of dilution presents an implicit comparison whereby you know, aspects of cult uh, incidents of cultural genocide are being compared to the Holocaust and they're found wanting. In a more direct manner, Mr. Federspiel of Denmark argued to his colleagues at the General Assembly, quote, it would show a lack of logic and of a sense of proportion to include in the same convention both mass murders and gas chambers and the closing of libraries. 
In such efforts to reduce the law of genocide to that which is justiciable, the Holocaust was mobilized as a frame of reference to narrow the concept to its physical manifestation, which is also how it has been applied in practice. And I'm going to quote Alex Hinton a lot, who's here, uh, in this paper, simply because, partially because his work has, very, has influenced me greatly, but he's also been a leader in the area of critical genocide studies. But Hinton notes that the argument of dilution serves a gatekeeping function, limiting what reasonable accusations might be made concerning acts of attempted group destruction. So our accusational framework is therefore founded on an initial comparison. And this comparison was used to exclude from protection certain foundations of group life, to use Lemkin's phrasing, namely those related to cultural reproduction of the group. But this is not all. I'd argue that implicit in the creation of the United Nations Genocide Convention and embedded in the travaux préparatoires is a notion that some groups are worthier, worthier of protection than others. The discussion around cultural genocide is also telling here. For some delegates, the idea that their nations had been complicit in the destruction or the attempted destruction of cultural groups through forced assimilation seemed ridiculous. Uh, evolutionary standards for assessing the value of groups were in vogue at this time. <clears throat> And even Lemkin was hesitant to suggest that sovereign nations did not have the right to try to integrate subject peoples. In this vein, Mr. Petrin, the representative from Sweden, noted, quote, the acts which according to Article 3 would constitute cultural genocide might be far less serious than those specified in Article 2. For instance, in the case of measures of educational policy, it might be difficult to estimate their scope in relation to the cultural position of a minority. The question could arise whether, for example, the fact that Sweden had converted the lapse to Christianity might not lay her open to the accusation that she had committed an act of cultural genocide. So he can even sit there in the General Assembly and talk about the forced assimilation of lapse and state this baldly with no sense that he's going to be judged or his country's going to be judged that this is simply presented as an absurdity. So Lemkin's universal ethic of preserving global diversity is here compromised by the particular prejudices of the era. Some groups, it seems, are too barbaric or primitive to be deserving of protection of their forms of group life. Hinton has noted the language of progress that announces the Genocide Convention, marking it as a crime condemned by the civilized world and thus as something committed by barbarians. But the flip side of this focus on civilization is the notion of barbarism, that certain barbarous groups are therefore not worthy of protection. Um, it also then has the effect of, of um, blocking out or creating boundaries around what sort of experiences count as potentially destructive to a group. So again, going back to that notion of territory, indigenous connection to territory or to specific animal species cannot be part of the framework of our understanding of genocide because these are not seen as part of group life. Although for certain groups, they are integral parts of group life. A boundary has been made. Certain groups' views are not represented within this founding moment of law. So to bring us back to our theme of conflict and convergence, what I hope to have communicated here is how the drive toward convergence where a common understanding of genocide is an exercise in boundary making that introduces what I believe to be arbitrary and contingent exclusions into the very process of understanding and preventing genocide. <clears throat> so it may seem contra contradictory that convergence lends itself to boundary making and exclusion to establishing a set of groups to be protected from genocide and leaving outside this privileged realm groups that are deemed not to merit the same protection. <clears throat> but the move towards convergence around a definition does raise the specter of what, again, Alex refers to as the redactic, which we will describe simply here as the work of editing out. In order to perform the magic of legal reduction and to make formal law applicable within complex genocide contexts, redaction removes that which might complicate the picture. And it is not only peripheral settler colonial genocides, such as those that are the focus of my work, that are often left on the outside. Also slipping through the accusational frame are events such as the destruction of Jewish synagogues in Germany from 1938 onwards, a topic which my colleague Adam Muller recently hosted a virtual exhibit on in Winnipeg, and we had a lengthy discussion about. Such destruction becomes viewed as antecedent to genocide, 
rather than integral to genocide. It's edited out of the genocidal event, which again, I think is a problematic temporalization of genocide to speak in the form of genocide as an event, which I'll discuss here. Uh, more capacious processual approaches to genocide studies have recently tried to complicate the notion of the genocidal event. Uh, they've emerged in recent years to deal with some of the dynamism of genocide and thereby move beyond a synchronic notion of the genocide event. So examples such as Dirk Moses' work that's looked at the movement towards genocidal moments or the work of Michael Mann where he looks at processes of radicalization from plan A to plan C or plan D which is the moment of what he would refer to as murderous ethnic cleansing. But many of us here would refer to as genocide. Um, show examples of models that move beyond a simple linear, linear approach to understanding genocide as moving from intent to action and instead give us an approach where there's moments of intensification and abatement. So we get a, we get a more up and down, a more varied line, but still seems to me somewhat linear. Um, I prefer to understand genocide more as a um, mutating or shape-shifting phenomena. One that takes different shapes depending upon the obstacles, the challenges, the changing local, national, institutional, international factors in which the genocidal parties, the perpetrators, and the targets exist within. With this sort of understanding, it's not just about looking at moments of intensity, intensification and abatement. For example, in my work, I wouldn't look at the US case and see the, um, the move from the so-called Indian Wars and the policies of removal towards one of forced assimilation through American Indian boarding schools as a moment of abatement. I would see this as simply a mutation, mutation in the logic. Uh, for various reasons. One of the reasons being that um, it was decided that it was more expensive to kill an Indian than it was to educate one. The simple economic argument was one of the factors in making that decision, causing a mutation towards dealing with the Indian problem in a different manner. In Canada, I would even go so far as to look at the ways in which these mutations shape themselves or reshape themselves within what we would call reparations processes or, or so-called justice processes. If you look at processes of treaty making in Canada, for example, um, although these are presented as a moment of justice, what they typically are are instead moments of certainty making, of attempting to fit the indigenous community that in some parts of Canada are not under treaty, which I'll talk about maybe if I have time in later, into the Canadian economic and property framework. So, Indigenous groups going to treaty making who may not have had their territory acknowledged will get a portion of that territory acknowledged and possibly some compensation. But in return for that, they're expected to build their governing capacity to fit within a North American context. Um, their property usually is shifted into a fee simple framework of in severalty, uh, so that it's no longer collectively owned property, it's now individually owned property. There's all sorts of compromises that are built into the process that ultimately still treat the Indian as a problem or the indigenous person as a problem that needs to be solved through these justice processes. They're still about force fitting them into the North American framework. So, <clears throat> to some extent, conflict seems a natural outcome of a convergent that is based, convergence that is based on the redactic editing out of phenomena that is judged to complicate the picture. As with the statement I received that Canadian residential schools are not genocide, this is a conflict that goes nowhere and leaves our field static. The alternative may to be begin with a complicated picture and then demand more of the frame. Now, let's see. I'm going to need to skip ahead here slightly so that I don't break my promise, which is important to me that I will be within 35 to 40 minutes. So, uh, for those of you who have read the paper or who are reading along, can uh, go ahead a little bit here. So, 
<laughs> I argue that genocide studies needs to encourage unrentingly critical approaches to its own foundations. Current work on forgotten and hidden genocides, in this sense, is more than a collection of understudied topics within the field. These cases are opportunities for debate that might contest the ontological assumptions based on which our conceptual architecture has been built. Through contestation with groups such as indigenous peoples, whose claims to group destruction may not neatly fit the categorical and juridical frames of accusation we have established, advances can be made in our understanding of genocide. This is where conflict, or what Canadian philosopher James Tully promotes as an ethic of agonism, is of benefit to genocide studies. Opening space for practices of contestation allows us to challenge our own redactic, all that we exclude from consideration. In short, cases that challenge reigning definitions of genocide and strive for inclusion within the canon are not threats to the meaningfulness of the term. That is, by making it seem like genocide is everywhere and anywhere. But rather opportunities to challenge the basic assumptions we make when we engage in decision making about what forms of group destruction matter and what forms of groups are worthy of protection. So Canadian residential schools are not genocide. The writer's a prick not because he engaged in conflict, but because he rendered a decision and closed down conversation. He imposed convergence rather than reveling in critique and conversation. It was judgment. Judgment based upon some criterion which he didn't even alert me to. I would have welcomed critique, and I'll welcome critique from anyone here. Uh, hopefully, I won't go away crying. Um, although that's always possible, I cry a lot. Um, but, you know, that would have been welcome. A welcome conversation. It was judgment. The violence of this act lay not in his conflict with my reading of history, but in his effort to foreclose discussion. It, sometimes our definitional processes are examples of what we might refer to as symbolic violence. And we risk a performative contradiction here when we present ourselves as anti-violence scholars who then are willing to accept certain amounts of symbolic violence in closing down that sort of discussion. Now, I think an interesting question to ask me, which I cover a little bit in the revised version of the paper is, well, good. So, Professor Wolford, are you going to be welcoming debates about white genocide into your classroom uh, next week when you go back to teaching genocide studies? Or are you going to be welcoming um, debates about abortion as genocide? I mean, there's the dilution argument, I feel it. I, I know it's, it's real. There's very politicized uses. But, again, with this need to arrive at momentary decisions, of definitions so that we have something that's usable to move forward, I do think we have some basic building blocks of a genocide concept. We do have a notion of genocide being a purposive or intentional act. How we define that may differ. Of it involving groups, again, how we define those may differ. And invo invoking an idea of destruction. The groups are threatened by some form of destruction. So those terms are there as a basis, and I think some of these very politicized claims can be quite easily excluded based upon those terms. However, I also think those terms are what we need to interrogate and relentlessly interrogate through our activities. Okay, for the last 10 minutes of my talk, I'm gonna shift a little bit and again talk about my earlier PhD research back in, in British Columbia. Because um, before I became fully immersed in genocide, I was focused on the British Columbia Treaty process. As I alluded to earlier, uh, this is a process, what we used to call a lands claim, land claims process, um, whereby the indigenous nations of British Columbia, most of whom, a vast majority of whom, had no treaty relationships to the Canadian government, who simply had their land um, reduced and taken from them. Uh, we're finally engaging in a treaty process where the argument that B British Columbia had been terra nullius, that they had not had proper ownership of the land in that Lockean sense that uh, comes up so well in uh, Eric's paper, Professor White's paper, um, that they did not occupy the land and therefore the land was free for the taking in British Columbia. So in the 1990s, a treaty process starts. And as part of my PhD research, I was interviewing elders and community leaders, and frequently they would bring up the discussion of genocide. And at that point, I was also 
a teaching assistant for genocide studies class. And what I was hearing, or what I was tempted to say, well, no, what you're saying doesn't fit the definition. They were talking about a broad variety of, of um, actions taken against their communities. So it included the banning of indigenous spiritual practices, the decimation of aquatic or animal life through overfishing, overhunting, and pollution, forced transformation of indigenous governance practices, loss of sacred territories, sacreds in quotes here, forced assimilation of children, and so on. Now, these were elders. They weren't the politicians of their communities. They weren't offering this as an attempt to achieve some political gain. What they were trying to do was translate their experience to me in a language I would understand. It's part of a, an everyday resistance to the exclusion indigenous peoples face in Canada of trying to have their experience make sense for European scholars, European raised uh, politicians, etc. So the references they made to the Holocaust or genocide were, at the time, often dismissed as being simply polemical. But they fit a broader pattern of indigenous assertions of their humanity in the face of a logic of elimination that has placed them as a dying or doomed race too primitive to survive a complex and changing social world. Uh, one would see similar acts of translation at the negotiation table, which I attended the negotiations and observed them. In one case, a Coast Salish community went point by point through their history, showing what was happening in their communities at the same time that a major events in European history were taking place. So they mentioned things like uh, the, the building of the pyramids, the first Olympic Games, showing the length of time they had been there and their relationship with that territory over this history. And the lead negotiator for the province simply said, this history is the reason we're here, but we can't focus on this today. We have to move forward. We have to figure out what our forward moving, what our, our future relationship is going to look like. This act using these skills of mediation taken straight from the Harvard, the Harvard School of Mediation was an act of symbolic violence. It silenced the past, it silenced an attempt to translate their experience into terms that were understandable, that would help be a basis for this negotiation, and instead use the focus on a future as a way to circumscribe the discussions. Now, this is something that indigenous peoples have often had to do, and it comes around when we see things like discussions of sacred sites, and that's why I said this is in quotations, because the notion of sacred sites was often also a translation, an attempt to preserve territory, and to do so, compromises had to be made. So territory often had to be presented as being bounded, as having a clear boundary, when you know, the, the sacred spaces may have been more fluid than that, not necessarily fitting that kind of uh, territorial understanding of property being clearly boundaried and owned. So a translation would occur. So this, relevance has rel this example has relevance to the project of genocide comparison, because um, comparative methodology often deals in the world of unacknowledged translations such as these. In the quest to discover a uniform pattern or set of traits or categories that are true for all genocides, we too often reduce complex local histories into the governing terms of our genocide studies methods or models. We fail to delve into the different ways of seeing and knowing the world that are culturally variant and seldom do we contest our own assumptions with understandings of perpetration and destruction drawn from other cultural frameworks. Now this critique of certain forms of comparative methodology is not new. In 1896, Franz Boas criticized comparative anthropology using a different language, but on similar grounds. Boas argued that, quote, we have seen that the comparative method can hope to reach the results for which it is striving only when it bases its investigations on the historical results of researches which are devoted to laying clear the complex relations of each individual culture. This was after Boaz was, in the words of Isaiah Laredo Wilner, civilized by the Kwakwakawa, I hope I said that. even I have trouble with that one, um, the Kwakwakawa, who taught him their self-understanding of culture as a fluid rather than static cultural possession. Following the Kwakwakawak understanding of culture, 
synchronic comparisons of culture appeared no longer feasible without first grappling with the diachronic complexity of the group. So in comparative genocide studies, specific histories of group identity formation and attempted destruction are translated for listeners from other cultural backgrounds and reinterpreted through the lens of genocide studies, becoming a translation of a translation. Then they must stand before a canonical or prototypical case, such as the Holocaust, to be measured. Lost in such translation is a curiosity with how the term has localized meaning and makes sense in relation to the experiences of those who feel themselves to be its targets. Genocide is not simply a concept to be owned and possessed at the center by a sanctified group of gatekeepers. It has this local meaning, and I think this comes out very clearly when one speaks to residential school survivors in Canada about their experiences and the ways in which it impacted their ability to form relations. Uh, Adam and I work with a woman by the name of Mary Cruchane, for example, who remembers her first trip to the Fort Alexander Indian Residential School and first confronting the nun at the door who had the big red heart. And she was excited to be going to this school. She had seen comic books. She was excited about learning the English language, about learning more about this culture that was, un was slightly familiar but still foreign to her. And she really wanted to read those speech bubbles in the comics. After a couple of years of that school, she remembers going home to her family uh, in the short periods in the summer where they got to go home. And everyone, this is in the community of Saigin, an Anishinaabe community. They were speaking Anishinaabe at home. And she, as a very young girl, under the age of 12, challenged her parents, said, we speak only English in this house. No more, no more Indian language. And her father looked at her and said, I don't know this little girl anymore. From that point on, their relationship was severed. She hated her parents, could not stand their brown faces, had internalized the racist attitudes towards her parents that she had learned at that school. So I'm getting to the 35 minute point. So I'm gonna start wrapping things up and maybe move a little bit away from reading the text of this paper. But where I was moving in the second section of the paper is to talk about an ethic of hospitality. Uh, it's also drawn somewhat from, from Derrida, but I think um, um, Zygmunt Bauman also has the same sort of influence from Emmanuel Levinas to bring out this ethic of the face, this ethic of responsibility to the other that comes with a notion of hospitality. The good host has a responsibility to try to learn as much as they can about the other, to ask questions, to welcome, to get to know. And I think an ethic of hospitality is important in genocide studies as we try to understand things from the perspective of those who experience these events. This brings us to a potentially contradictory situation though where I'm both suggesting we need agonism, or, um, that we need a certain degree of uh, contention and yet hospitality. Yet I think in the work of um, someone like Chantal Mouffe, we see that these are not opposed categories. In fact, they do work together. Um, Mouffe, for example, argues that agonism is at the core of hospitality, where there is a confrontation, where there's, quote, confrontation where the aim is neither annihilation nor assimilation of the other and where the tensions between the different approaches contribute to enhancing the pluralism that characterizes a multipolar world. I mean, one could almost translate this into Lemkin's own language when he's speaking about the genocide concept. In our confrontation with alleged examples of genocide, our tendency through juridical reasoning and colonial rationalities that are often at the core of our discipline is to either annihilate, that is to treat the case as non-genocide, or assimilate, that is to force it into our reigning frameworks. Whereas the true lessons may be instead found in the tensions presented by the case with respect to the ways in which we think about and understand genocide. Hospitable comparison makes an agonistic and critical genocide studies possible rather than interfering with its practice. It does not seek to force convergence, but rather to convert conflict into a tolerant and respectful multifocal dialogue allows decisions 
to form out of the processes of contestation, but realistically accepts that any momentary decision will be subject of later contestation. Now, hospitality, hospitality also doesn't mean one cannot ask an unwelcome or disrespectful guest to leave, I'll add. Um, these two practices are methodologies of critical genocide ethos, agonism and hospitality, are more than a plea for multi-directionism, uh, which I won't go into right now since I'm out of time. Um, but for me, <clears throat> they do capture an approach that allows one to problematize the role of the gatekeeper, the role of the God's eye, and the tendency to be a prick. So, thank you. Well, can we oh, I can't, I can't keep this? I think that, um, no, keep, keep this for a minute. I think that in order to break up the morning so you don't have to sit and listen um, to, to two interventions without getting a chance to hear your voices, um, we thought we might just take two or three interventions here. Okay, I'm happy to wait to the end, too, because the, 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 the contrast between the two papers, I mean, it's up to, if everyone okay, needs a break, I then that's fine, too. Maybe you just get a, a few comments out just so people can get them on the table and you right. don't have to answer them at great length. Oh, I don't? Oh, I do, okay. <laughs> the audience exercise their voices. Sure. Are there um, two or three interventions that people would like to make? Um, would you start? Both. First of all, uh, thank you for this very uh, stimulating paper. And I'm, uh, on many levels, I'm very with you. Um, um, I feel I did some studies on Bolivia on the indigenous population. And um, uh, when you talked about cultural, um, this kind of cultural destruction, I was thinking in, that there's also kind of a, sometimes a misunderstanding what actually cultural uh, destruction means. Because when you think about the indigenous population, as you mentioned this in passing, they have different forms of production different forms of living most uh, or in most cases collectively organized and sometimes I, I feel uh, that people take for example the mode of production which is collectively organized as a culture which is only in part because the other part is the, uh, they earn their living like this and if you think about genocide the convention the destruction of livelihood is part of this so there are blurred lines here yeah, yeah? And I think part of the colonization, what you are talking about, is actually exactly this. That uh, the cultural uh, the destruction is taken, but is kind of uh, covering other parts which could be easily included in the mm. college. Yeah, and I wouldn't disagree on the, on the point that you know, there are blurred lines between these categories. And I tend to make that argument. I don't use the word, don't usually use language cultural genocide in my own work on indigenous peoples because, you know, what is cultural, what is biological, what is physical, these things are incredibly intertwined um, within, for the indigenous groups with whom, with whom I'm working. So it's, you know, you know, we introduce a level of artificiality by making those discussions. And I do think in, um, that there is capacity within parts of the United Nations Genocide Convention to, to recognize this too. So I mean, that's part of my project too, is to open up these terms of the convention, which I think, you know, the idea, the, the mens rea portion of the convention, that genocide is an intentional act to destroy a group, are very important. So let's take that. You are Yes, I wouldn't. I would not want you to go home crying. So uh, <laughs> the the <coughs> excuse me, the legal case is an easy one. Uh, even though I do appreciate the role of law in the response to genocide, and I, not just the judicial, in, in the narrow sense of the term, but I still appreciate the, the thoughts of people like Justice Jackson or Roosevelt before Nuremberg when they said we need to document the incredible things that have occurred with witnesses under oath and all the written documents so posterity can never doubt what has occurred. I continue to, to appreciate that and I do understand that the institution of law needs a clear vocabulary to, to arrive at the kinds of statements that you cited but only do so after deliberative process. Deliberative, of course, within the rules of the, of the law and I would say the same is true for other institution spheres, and the other institution spheres would include the world of scholarship. Uh, also in scholarship, we, 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 have a, we follow a different logic than the law, uh, but we too need to arrive at a clear uh, uh, discourse. We need conceptual 
clarity. And I was, I was wondering if you are throwing, and I understand your skepticism. I, I understand your, your wanting to be open toward those who experience repression. Uh, but I was wondering if you are throwing out the baby with the bathwater and deprive us of the conceptual clarity that we need as, uh, in, in the world of scholarship in order to communicate effectively. Yeah. Not necessarily. Like, I think, you know, when scholars are doing that sort of comparative work, and I'm going to, where's Holly? Mention Holly's paper here. You know, there's a, there's a sort of a positionality statement there. She's expressing that she's using these terms in a particular way mm -hmm. that doesn't include these cases, and she's making these decisions for pragmatic purposes. I think that sort of reflexivity mm -hmm. and honesty in scholarship is really, you know, a, a good starting point, because then we can have a conversation about that. And so I don't want to necessarily say, don't have any terms, but mm -hmm. recognize that your terms have, you know, there's always going to be something, some contingencies to them, mm -hmm. and then we can move forward there mm -hmm. once that's on the table, mm -hmm. just as I hope. I can be extremely honest here that so I'm coming at this from a, a position of having worked with indigenous elders and survivors and having my opinion, I maybe could say I've been civilized like Boaz mm -hmm. in, a, in a different framework, and that's kind of the framework that's shaping my own conceptualization, although I'm doing so here today, not in their language, but in the language of post structural theory and other. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Thank you. <clears throat> Just two quick <clears throat> points. I mean, one has to do with the idea that formal Euclidal reasoning is phallic and, um, and the God trick, right? But I'm wondering how you reconcile that with the appellate process, and particularly something like the Supreme Court, where, of course, decisions arrived at by collectively and discursively, right? Like, it's not simply a matter of the brute imposition of will. So is is the law really as prickish as you say? And then secondly, the ethic of hospitality in your discussion, I like this a lot, um, but you stress the responsibilities of the host. But of course, in the moral economy of the, mm -hmm. of the, hosp of the hospitable yeah. arrangement, the guest also has responsibilities. I'm wondering if you could sort of speculate on the responsibilities of the guest. Yeah, I think... Uh, uh, on the first day, I had this image of dating myself here, but that's where the dead Kennedys got themselves in major lawsuit for a picture in one of their albums called Penis Landscape, where you have multiple pricks. I mean, you can't have multiple pricks, because that's not too quick and simple an answer. I mean, they're still working. I mean, there is dialogue amongst them, but they're still working within the same legal framework that privileges a certain form of reasoning. They, you, you can have a collective God trick, but it introduces into it some dialogical components that are that complicated and make it not just as simple as my discussion uh, suggests. Um, on the second point, I think it's a very good point, and I think this is where I find um, reading out a little bit out of my field in the, you know, the, the ethics, uh, philosophers of, of ethics and justice are helpful in thinking about what does it mean to be a good guest to a conversation? Yeah. And what do you need to do? Mean, so you can't enter into someone's house. And this might also exclude people who are arguing for that white genocide has taken place because it's premised on a fact that you know, it is abusive, that excludes other voices from being able to be heard in that conversation. So you can't really enter into a conversation if you come in with all of these, um, your own prejudices, your own uh, very significant exclusions. So that's not my area, but I think that is a good line to follow to try to think more about this issue that I haven't thought of enough. So I have one more question from the audience, and then we're going to um, introduce Philip. Um, so the, this is more specific to your work on the indigenous community, and the question is, is the in the iconography of the Native American by Euro-Americans, Euro Euro uh, the questioner asks, could the mutation of cultural genocide into boarding schools be actually one of jealousy, supposing that they couldn't kill them, couldn't be them, so why not destroy what we can? Yeah, I mean, that, that is a nice, uh, um, concise way of, of you know, describing a particular motivation. When I look at this work, what I try to do, and this comes a part, a new part of the paper that I didn't talk about, was you know thinking about the state as itself uh, a negotiated, non-monolithic body, where um, and not just not just the state, but various 
broad level fields of social action, whether we're talking about religion, the economy, um, the state, or the bureaucratic field, as I would refer to it. All of these groups coming together in this point, discussing the Indian problem and what is to be done now that you know, the killing seems too unsavory and too costly. What is to be done about the American Indian they grapple together with very different ideas. Some people are coming from a very scientific, racist point of view, that indigenous people are the backwards, they can never be uh, assimilated. Some are coming with a sort of Christian humanism, suggesting that they're blank slates upon which um, Christianity can be writ and civilization brought in full. And they're negotiating this with state actors who also have a broad variety of interests depending on where they work within the state. So I see that as being a motivation uh, of, of some, but you know, some still had a very romantic notion of the indigenous person who would then emerge from these schools as a European, but still with some of those noble capacities. So, thank you. Thanks very much. <coughs> thank you.